Hello everyone, and welcome to the Dashcast, where we go about trying to find the most interesting people in the world of cryptocurrencies, finance, and business. On this episode of the podcast, I was fortunate enough to have some time to sit down with Bill Barheit, the founder of Abra, an application that's taken the crypto space by storm over the past few months. Not only are we going to be discussing Bill's past as an entrepreneur in a variety of different sectors, but along with that as well, I want to talk to Bill about what they've been able to do to push Abra forward against other exchanges and wallets in the space, and talk about their most recent feature of allowing the individuals to trade equities with cryptocurrencies. Our sponsor for this podcast is Taxbit. The 2018 tax season has officially begun. Taxbit automates your entire tax filing process by linking up with your exchanges and wallets, running your transactions through their tax engine, and auto-generating all of your tax forms. 2018 was a tough year for most crypto users. Taxbit will help you recoup some of your losses by producing the tax forms you need to claim your tax refund. Sign up today using the promo code DATADASH to receive a 10% discount and a 100% money back guarantee that your taxes will be taken care of this tax season. What's going on, everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash, and welcome to this episode of the Dashcast. We're very fortunate to have Bill Barhype here, the founder of Abra. And today we're going to be discussing a lot of exciting things in regards to the Abra application, uh, and also just a little bit about Bill's past as well as an entrepreneur, where he's come from, and how he's gotten to this point, and even a really exciting feature as well within the Abra application that allows. Really, I think the first cryptocurrency exchange to allow users to actually go about trading equities in this case as well on the same platform. So, Bill, thanks for taking the time to talk. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. It's great to be here. Look forward to the discussion. Yeah, definitely. It should be an ex- interesting one. And I'm excited more than anything, you know, to, you know, to see these kind of creative approaches in the cryptocurrency space. As much as I want to talk about this equities trading feature and all these things we'll dive into, I always do like to start off very simple and just ask you, uh, you know, where do you come from personally? Uh, you know, where got you started on this route of being an entrepreneur and what's your major focus? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm American. I'm from uh, New York City area. I grew up in that area. Uh, My background is really in computer science. Uh, I'm a tech geek at heart. I love software. I love all the problems that software can solve. Um, Big mantra and, you know, that whole Mark Andreessen ethos of software is eating the world. And and for me, my personal passion the last uh, kind of 10, 15 years has been around financial inclusion, uh, democratizing access to financial services, myriad kind of payments, um, remittances, uh, investing. Uh, which has been a big focus here. And then obviously in the last 10 years, integrating kind of the crypto cryptocurrency model into that as a, as, as kind of a key uh, foundational layer. Um, so, but I've, I've done everything from work on internet in my Netscape days to uh, working as a researcher and, and I developed my own software when I was at Goldman uh, to, um, you know, cryptography projects at the CIA. So. I've been fortunate that I've been able to do a lot of different things, but a lot of now it's kind of serving me well and bringing it all together uh, to build out Abra. Wow. So you worked kind of from a background in this case. I mean, you mentioned you worked at the CIA. You've also worked at Goldman and a lot of big financial corporations. So you're kind of taking all of that experience, not to mention as well, a mixture of your passions as well for financial inclusion, remittance services, which is going to be a big part in, I think, cryptocurrencies in this case. I think we just saw today uh, JP Morgan tried to launch uh, their own cryptocurrency, which is going to be used for more international and uh, institutional banking remittances. But I think really the real application here is for everyday consumers uh, in the sense of financial inclusion and being able to shift money, you know, where it needs to be on the world stage. So it's good to see yeah. that you, you're passionate about that. So I definitely am I'm interested in this point, you know, uh, you know, to definitely learn about Abra. What were some of the things that you'd worked on beforehand? You were mentioning that you'd worked at a Goldman Sachs. You know, what were some of the kind of focuses that you built towards? So, so I think I would kind of look at my background in three areas that I really wouldn't have been able to figure out Abra without doing, right? So the first is understanding uh, information security, kind of the cypherpunk manifesto perspective, mm-hmm. right? Uh, personal privacy, uh, how cryptography enables personal privacy, how public private key cryptography enables the cryptography we use today, uh, and then just building up the stack, you know, to get to kind of modern cryptography. Number nine of that with Digicash a bunch of years ago, and you know, the, I've spent a lot of time, you know, understanding that the whole idea of solving the double spend problem and why it's so important to have a public facing, um, you know, crypto solution to the double spend problem. 
um, which is an interesting uh, antecedent to what you were mentioning about uh, Jamie Dimon, uh, which obviously is, is orthogonal to the same idea, right? So um, then I would say financial services. Um, I, I kind of got my, my, my MBA in finance. I'm sitting on the trading desk uh, in, in uh, New York at, at Goldman. Uh, it was a fixed income trading desk. I learned all about how everything works from you know, fixed income mathematics, which is which is not for the faint of heart, to structured products, to you know, securitized bank debt, um, all of which is very relevant to what Abra is doing now, especially uh, in terms of how our hedging system works. Um, and then, you know, also just understanding consumer internet, right? So at Netscape, we kind of we kind of created the consumer web as a as a as a mm -hmm. productized idea, uh, uh, and now you know having worked on consumer mobile applications, games, which is actually very relevant in terms of, you know, when you dig in, in terms of how wallets work and how account management works, and onboarding works, and, you know, all of the kind of behavioral economics that go into that. It's all relevant and we use all of those things. And, 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 and in a way, Abra really brings all of that together. Uh, I spent a lot of time actually, uh, we started a nonprofit, so I spent a lot of time in Haiti uh, rural Mexico, Central America, rural Philippines, uh, a lot of places most Americans wouldn't even consider going, just building out banking services, trying, trying to build money transfer payments, working with MFIs, doing, doing lending. And my vision has always been, why can't we have one kind of WhatsApp for money, right, the way we do in messaging, but for payments, whether it's mm. for investing, lending, sending money, we have Venmo in the U.S., we have WePay in China, we have Paytm in India. But they're all silos, right? Well, why Why do we have to have that silo, that thing set up by arbitrary government rules? I get the rules, and I agree with a lot of them, but not all of them. But but that still doesn't mean that we can't have that kind of one app, right? And so, so if you want to democratize access to financial services, you need to have the right to enable that one app, and that's what we're trying to do with with Apple now and and really it brings together I think all those things that I, I was lucky enough to be able to work on uh, in, in a unique way interesting okay so you know I think from the background that you have in this case uh, Bill I, I think it's a really interesting mixture uh, to take into account for Abra and I think you mentioned something as well that I continue to complain about with most exchanges and that has to do with the you know ease of access in this case first off you have multiple platforms huge pain in the butt not to mention most of these platforms are built for uh, what I would signify as the less than 1% of global population that have adopted cryptocurrencies people right now in the crypto space are already struggling with cryptocurrency exchanges just imagine what it's going to be like trying to get 90 99 percent of people on cryptocurrencies or using some kind of framework that gains some exposure to it so we need to simplify things streamline them much better uh, what are you guys doing at Albert to really kind of help move that forward in that case you know to try, to try to bring more users on we probably have a different perspective on this than certainly the exchanges um and maybe even most people who think about as somebody who's, I'm a maximalist for Bitcoin in the sense that I think everybody is eventually going to use Bitcoin. Hmm. But where I differ from most maximalists is I think that most people aren't even going to know that they're using Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And, and, and let me explain what I mean by that. So I look at Bitcoin as TCPIP for money, right? And and so or money for the internet. Um, but money for the internet doesn't mean that I know that I have a Bitcoin wallet where I'm spending four Bitcoin on a New York Times article. Right, or, or 0.004, whatever, whatever the current price is, right? So um, it's just like, you know, you don't have to go out and basically do TCPI socket programming to watch Netflix, right? That would be crazy. Yeah. But eventually you get, you get these really beautiful user experiences that allow you to stream house cards and not even know that you're using some sophisticated network programming technology. I think that, you know, money as, or programmable money as a protocol uh, is incredibly valuable and solves huge problems around access uh, and other problems. And so Abra believes that providing a base layer for programmable money and then building consumer applications on top is the future of banking. Now that may be, that future may be five, ten years out, we may be the first, we may be, too, we may be early, we may be spot on in terms of our timing. At this point, it's, it's unclear. But the ability to build services like stock investing, payments and money transfer, 
lending, all using crypto, solves so many problems. It eliminates borders, uh, it lowers costs, it provides access. A lot of people are shut out of the banking system because they're just not profitable customers for the banks. And so they basically create so much friction mm -hmm. in them getting a bank account. So, so the term unbanked is, it's not really a useful term because it doesn't really tell you what's going on vis-a-vis -vis what the bank wants or vis-a-vis -vis what the consumer actually wants. Because consumers don't go around saying, oh, I need to be banked. They, they think from a financial services perspective, I, I need to be able to save my money and hopefully grow it. Uh, I need to get access to credit for whatever reason, right? The same way we have credit cards, which, which we take for granted. Um, I, I need to be able to send money on occasion, either to pay a bill, get money to family members. And, you know, they don't really care. They being the general public, I think for the most part, doesn't really care how that happens, especially outside the U.S. In the U.S., we take banks for granted, but, but there's 3 billion people who, either even if, they have no bank account. They have a bank account because the government of India forced it on them, but the balance is zero. Or they're operating in some favela at a shadow banking system in places like Brazil where they're just not part of the system. So Bitcoin, in my opinion, creates a new foundational layer that provides the, the, the liquidity basis for that programmable money. Now, that's great for institutional investors and people who know what Bitcoin as a currency or a commodity is because they can provide liquidity to the system vis-a-vis -vis the traditional banking system, and that's you know the function of exchanges. But the average person who's just using Bitcoin in the background may never end up participating in that. So we may end up with a model where there's 100 million people on the planet who are investing in crypto and a whole bunch of large institutionals that are investing in crypto because it's providing liquidity for everyone else to be able to drive the applications that uh, are changing the banking system. For example, if Abra is providing a stock investing service that uses crypt crypto, Bitcoin collateralized contracts, we call it C3, crypto collateralized mm -hmm. contract, that uses Bitcoin as the collateral for every single stock investment for consumers in India, in China, Indonesia, Mexico, right? Those are all people who, whether they know it or not, have actually bought Bitcoin because that Bitcoin serves as the basis for their investments. And then we simply adjust the value of the Bitcoin they're holding, right, based upon whether the stock that they want to invest in goes up or down. They never actually take possession of the stock. So that programmable money layer is now giving them investment exposure to any assets. But they don't have to know that they're holding Bitcoin. The liquidity system that we've set up via exchanges, institutions, other trading houses, day traders, is, ma is managing the liquidity. So if everybody's doing this in India and in China, Indonesia, Mexico, the price of Bitcoin is obviously going to go up because everybody's collateralizing their investments using Bitcoin. But that liquidity has to come from somewhere, right? And, and so, so this is one of those interesting phenomena where traditional financial markets and, other, and, and this kind of internet technology will meet in a way where they may not really know about each other. And that's, I don't know if that's ever happened before. Um, you know, you may see a little bit of an analogy in the traditional banking system with things like repo markets and things that happen in the background with traditional banking that the average consumer um, doesn't necessarily understand. But I would actually claim that a lot of that is not for the betterment of mankind because of the way, you know, the consumer gets screwed. Mm -hmm. But what I'm talking about really is for the betterment of mankind because it levels the playing field dramatically in terms of, of consumer access and uh, the ability to conduct commerce and other things that aren't possible for a lot of people today. Yeah, so I really like this idea of using it kind of, uh, you know, putting cryptocurrency in its actual technology and the knowing of using cryptocurrencies, having that in the background, because as you mentioned, this could be just like we had with the internet, people don't understand TCPI. Like if, if we, yeah, if we were to basically, so if, if I, I'm getting this correct, I just want to see if I can summarize this quite well, Bill, is that Abra's approach right now is to try to keep everything on a protocol level. And on the surface, you're, you know, maybe investing in some cryptocurrencies if they want, but when you're buying stocks, when you're, you know, you know let's say that's a future where people can buy early stage equity and, and companies or buy into partial amounts of real estate, and, you know, the assets could go on and on. Mm -hmm. That Bitcoin is actually the underlying collateral, and again, we don't. We a lot of us won't know that we're using Bitcoin, but it's going to be used as the underlying collateral as a monetary protocol. And with it, it comes its finite supply. It comes with you know the fixed amount that's going to be existent, and it's open to right. anyone in the world to use. Right. 
Hundred percent. So, so we really, I, we we sort of started off with a with a, an academic discussion about what the future of Bitcoin. So let, let's come back for a second and talk about what Abra actually does and why we're doing what you're what you're saying. So, so the goal of Abra is to be that WhatsApp of money, right? We want to democratize access to financial services so that it doesn't matter whether you're a poor farmer in the Philippines, a rich banker in New York. Uh, you know, a, a migrant worker coming between Mexico and the U.S., you have the same access to financial services as everyone else, okay? Now, we are committed to using Bitcoin as, like you said, the, the hard money, our gold, if you will, for collateralizing all of the instruments in our system, whether it's digital dollars, digital Apple stock, digital euros or pesos, uh, even digital XRP for, for some of our crazy users who are investing in XRP. We have a lot of, okay? So there's that, and then, but it's also a settlement layer, right? Uh, the Bitcoin blockchain acts effectively as a unit of uh, a ledger of account for these transactions, right? And that's really important because, from a decentralization perspective, it means that there's no central off switch for the contracts, the smart contracts that Abra is creating, that give people either investment exposure, allow them to hold digital dollars, whatever it is they're doing. Okay, um, and so in that regard, I, I actually would posit there's no other way to build Abra at global scale. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it was the solution that I had always been looking for to build that WhatsApp for money. Uh, and so to your point, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin means all of those things for us. It's the hard money asset that acts as the base layer. It's the programming layer that enables us to use the Bitcoin blockchain as the ledger, right? It's mm -hmm. the global check that, that settles all of these accounts, uh, all in one solution. Yeah. And to that point as well, one thing I like is that you're not only depending on the Bitcoin protocol, but because everything in this case of using as collateral in these, these smart contracts is actually going off the Bitcoin blockchain, you actually can allow users to hold their own funds. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So the, the, the idea of a crypto collateralized contract which is the basis for the assets in the upper system. We call them synthetic assets. A crypto collateralized contract allows you to hold a dollar on a phone without a dollar in a bank. The way you do that is you collateralize the contract with the equivalent in Bitcoin, right? So if I'm putting $100 on the phone, unbeknownst to me, somehow $100 in Bitcoin ended up in my Abra app. And that value of Bitcoin then adjusts itself based upon the value of the dollar. But what's really cool is Abra has no access to the collateral on your phone unless we're in the money on the contract. And then the smart contract automatically settles. But if the government comes to me and says, hey, I'm here to subpoena the $100 on your, or the $100 of Bitcoin, my, my response is we don't have it because it's on your phone. And you're holding the, the, the private key to that multi-sig contract. And you know that actually solves, it's not only solves security and control problems, which we think are really important because it's, it's, it's about your rights to your assets, but it also solves a whole bunch of other problems in terms of, you know, how do you offer a service in 200 countries where everybody has their own kind of banking laws around managing custody, managing mm -hmm. keys? You know, so if we're not managing your cust the custody of your keys or your funds or your crypto, then that puts us in a very different situation from a legal perspective, which is also great because that el eliminates a lot of friction in me being able to roll out new services, uh, but also in a very ethical way because you're not look every centralized exchange to my knowledge has been hacked okay that is not a reflection on bitcoin except for the value of bitcoin right um you know, i would claim that most exchanges aren't necessarily more or less hackable than uh google drive or or dropbox it's just that there's nothing of value there right mm -hmm. so it's not a poor reflection on the exchanges themselves it's 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 a it's the idea that you shouldn't be leaving valuable assets in centralized databases. It just doesn't make any sense. So so the idea of federating storage down to the individual user is the right way to do this. That was the way public private key cryptography intended this to be working in the first place. Uh, we're simply using it the correct way, uh, both as programmable money and as individual user held uh, bearer instruments. Interesting. So. 
kind of sticking to the mantra of becoming your own bank in this case, but also having a, a, a sense of access to financial services because you're using it as that pro color. So let's go ahead and walk through an example trade here just to, to get an understanding. You did a really good job explaining, I think, Bill, and in, uh, in regards to some of the technical side, but let's let's give a, a given scenario. So I want to buy sure. very simply just one share of Apple in this case. Let's say it's you yeah. know $200 just for simplicity's sake. So I want to buy one share of Apple. If Apple goes up $20 per share, in this case, so the ab wrap, it looks like I'm simply just buying a share of Apple with my Bitcoin. What happens there? What happens behind the scenes? Um, how am I going to actually gain that profit? You know, remember, the, the, there's two things you have to keep in mind here. There's the Abra wallet, and then there's the asset you're getting exposure to, which is Apple. So then remember, the Abra wallet, um, everything's inside is Bitcoin. Yeah. Okay. Now, the Apple share itself uh, is, is valued in dollars. So not only do we have to offset the value of Bitcoin versus the Apple share, but we also have to make sure that it reflects the, the movement of the value of Bitcoin versus the dollar at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So first we would say, okay, if the if the app if the price of Apple went up, uh, to, like you said, twenty dollars, and the price of Bitcoin versus the dollar stayed the same, then you would simply have twenty more dollars worth of Bitcoin. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Yeah. But if the price of the dollar versus Bitcoin went down then we would have to adjust for that first and then adjust for the for the price of the apple share so that at the end of the day the value of what you had in the wallet was exactly correct for the fact that it was the price of apple but valued in dollars mm-hmm. right? and so a lot of complexity going on in the background but it's automatic that's what the smart contract model does is it'll, it allows this to become in a way self-settling right so there's no kind of central clearing uh, but it still does the math correctly um, and and so, does that make sense? First of all, is yeah. That- so I'm I'm just saying. Let's say for example that uh, because of my investment in Apple with Bitcoin, I've I have an increase like uh, like amount of satoshis, or I have a larger Bitcoin amount in that case. Where does the extra yeah. portion come from in that case? Is it okay? So that that's a different story. So the first thing to understand is when you create this contract, you are effectively uh, making a uh, a quasi bet with Apple, just like when you mm-hmm. buy stock, you bet yeah. that the stock will go up versus down. Right. Okay. So, so Abra is the counterparty to that smart contract, right? You as the consumer have taken one side and Abra has taken the other side. Now you have collateralized the contract 100% with Bitcoins. In other words, if you, if you said, I want to buy $200 worth of Apple stock and you buy, you can buy fractions of a share with the system. It makes no difference. You could put 75 cents. We actually have a limit of five, a a lower limit of five. (laughs) You could put $5 into the Apple share, okay? On the other hand, Abra is ethically bound to say, hey, I am not going to take the other side of that bet unless I know I can make you whole in 100% of the instances, meaning if the price of Bitcoin plummets, right, versus Apple, I may owe you a lot of Bitcoin. Well, where is that Bitcoin coming from, right? So case in point, Last year, the price of Bitcoin fell, I think, what was it, 80% or 80 mm-hmm. plus percent. Abra had hundreds of thousands of users who've did, done hundreds of millions of dollars worth of transactions. That means we were giving a lot of people a lot of Bitcoin to make them whole as the price was plummeting. Where was that Bitcoin coming from and why did Abra not go broke? As, as a matter of fact, we made really good revenue last year. So what Abra does is when we enter into this contract, we also run a trading operation which hedges away our counterparty risk to you as the consumer. So in English, that means whether the price of Bitcoin goes up or down versus Apple, you're always going to be made whole if you're in the money on the contract. And Avra is always going to be made whole if we're in the money on the contract. And like I said, last year was a great proof point because the price of crypto plummeted and we had lots of people holding dollars and euros and pesos. Who, whose positions required a lot more Bitcoin in order to maintain their value, okay. right? And, and Abra was able to do that because our hedging operation eliminates that counterparty risk 100%. There's only one scenario we don't um, hedge away for, and that's if Bitcoin goes to zero quickly, I would owe all of our users an infinite amount of Bitcoin. So that's, that's the one risk that everyone in the system is taking. But it's the same risk with derivative markets that settle the yeah. dollar. If the dollar goes to zero, you know, and that that was part of the risk of, of what happened in 2007 when we might have had a run on banks was you could see a scenario where where run on banks could effectively make the dollar hyperinflate and, and go to zero. So so um, 
there's no backstop for that outside of having like uh, insurance. But effectively, the system deals with a huge price spike or a huge price fall in Bitcoin. It makes no difference. And that's managed by this kind of so-called hedging system that we run that manages that counterparty risk. Okay, interesting. Man, you guys have really thought the process through. And I think it's interesting, yeah. I mean, to, to see all this kind of coming alive. And I think really, like you mentioned, the first application that really treats this like a protocol uh, in order to, you know, kind of store wealth in a sense and being able to use it to access different financial services. So outside of this, you know, Bill, I mean, we've talked about equities as a big market to tackle. So congrats on the the fact that you guys have been able to meet that. What's the next thing that you want to tackle here? Because it, now that I'm starting to see this kind of vision, it seems like you can expand this to a lot of different things. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So so right now we only allow consumers to take one side of the of the bet, right? Like if you log into E-Trade, you can take either side of the bet, right? You can say, I think Apple's going to go up or I think Apple's going to go down. Right now, we would only allow you to make the bet that Apple's going to go up. We're going to change that. Eventually, you'll be able to make either bet, whether it's bets against the euro versus the dollar or Apple versus the dollar or uh, the dollar versus XRP. It makes no difference to us. You'll be able to decide whether you think XRP is going to go up or down. And then that's something that that will enable eventually. Uh, We think lending is a big deal. So, for example, you know, we have a lot of users in places like Mexico and the Philippines, they're all collateralizing their their investments, like I said, in Bitcoin. And if they're buying XRP for and sitting on a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, why are we lending, offering them the ability to borrow, for example, half that as cash? Yeah. Right. Um, they collateralize that into a new smart contract that allows us to access the collateral if they don't make their payments. That's a very low risk loan to the consumer that could drive interest rates down significantly on on personal collateralized loans uh, which in many cases are unavailable to uh, a lot of markets so i think that collateralized lending is something you're going to see uh, again all moving towards this idea of a single smartphone app that can do myriad financial services right and then the third area for me is payments and money transfer right so if you use app today there's a feature, and if you click on the upper left hamburger menu, there's a feature which says send money to Apple user. And you can send from pretty much any wallet in the app to any phone number in the world if that person has Abra, and they can receive the money as any currency that they want. So they can receive the money. If I send dollars, you can receive it as pesos. If you send pesos, I can receive it as Bitcoin. If I send Bitcoin, in theory, you can receive it as uh, Apple shares. Right, so so we have a very unique model for money transfer, all based upon, uh, again, the Bitcoin blockchain as a as a ledger and, and settlement layer, as well as the 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 the, the, the currency uh, underlying the contracts. And so I think as the Abra user base grows, using Abra as kind of that global Venmo is going to become very popular because it doesn't cost anything. So why not? Mm-hmm. If I have family in the Philippines, or if I have family in Mexico, or if I'm traveling and I, my, my kids are in Europe or in Asia, Abra is a fantastically easy way to facilitate that cross-border transfer instantly. Um, little to actually no, we don't charge any transaction fees for sending money. Hmm. So I, I think that that's the third leg in the stool, right? So you're going to see investing, credit, and money transfer all kind of in that one simple financial app over time. We're focusing on investing right now because we think that's the best use case to get people in the system get started off yeah and, yeah and to build on that bill you know uh, you're talking about uh, re- sending and receiving money money wiring or remittance in this yeah. case tell me if i'm wrong you were saying you can choose to receive it how you'd like so let's say for example every time a family member of i uh, a family member of mine wires money over to me from a different country into my abra wallet i can choose to have that bitcoin that he's sending to me I can convert that into Apple shares right away. I can convert it into dollars. I can convert it to any currency I want. Everything in Abra is a redemption and creation, or creation and redemption mm-hmm. of Bitcoin-based smart contracts. Whether it's me converting something on my phone from uh, dollars to Apple shares, or me sending something on my phone from Philippine pesos to dollars, it works the same way. In every case, you redeem a smart contract, and you create a new smart contract. The only difference between investing and sending money is in the case of investing, those two smart contracts are created on the same phone. In the case of sending money, 
they're created on two different phones. But the process is 100% the same in both cases. Mm -hmm. Wow, Phil, I mean, absolutely fascinating stuff. Uh, I mean, outside of uh, all the stuff we talked about, you know, what are some resources that people can check out? Uh, obviously, the Aber app is already out there, so they can download it and test it out. Uh, but what, yeah. would you, what would you recommend are like some good resources for people to turn to to learn more about what you guys are doing? Yeah, we've, we've spent and invested a lot of time and money into our blog site, which has a lot of content explaining how this works, why it works the way it does, uh, what we believe uh, in terms of the future of, of uh, the crypto markets as they relate to banking and, and, and you know, uh, this is synthetic asset model. So it's all there. Uh, just go to yabber.com and you can click on the blog site, read all that. Uh, obviously, the, 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 the apps are available on the app stores uh, people are pre-registered we've had tens of thousands of people already pre-register for uh, the uh, new equity product in in dozens of countries which is great it's not just U us where uh, I'm actually honestly I'm actually more excited about the equity products outside the US because you have a hundred ways to buy Apple shares right yeah. as in the US uh, and that's great but the person in Mexico or Middle East or in India they're shut out, especially if they can only afford a fraction of the share. Absolutely. Right? So I'm, I'm really excited about what we're doing, uh, probably more so outside the U.S. than, than in. Um, but, um, but yeah, so that's how people can find out about Abra. And, and we're on Twitter, uh, Abra Global. I'm Bill Barheit on Twitter. I'm reasonably active, uh, answering a lot of questions all the time and getting into debates about how this is all going. Um, we have a couple of people who also even respond on Reddit uh, on occasion to stuff we see. Well, Bill, I just want to say as a, a kind of wrap up here, I got to say it's very exciting to see something that isn't so much trying to really challenge the regulators. It's just simply saying, look, we're, we're following everything outside of the window of regulation. Our whole entire system doesn't depend on centralized parties and custodial solutions. You're taking all the good things that exist in cryptocurrencies. And as you mentioned, we're core to cryptography from the get go. And, uh, you know, actually molding that into a almost exchange like experience of simplifying things and offering financial services. And what you mentioned in regards to allowing people in different countries in regards to accessing share investment opportunities, I mean, that's just big, that's huge, it's a game changer, and it actually makes Bitcoin as a protocol act like a protocol in a sense that kind of adds that financial inclusion for anyone around the world. So uh, I think it's a very unique vision. Um, and I mean, I, I or sort of understood what Abra was doing, but from just the few minutes of talking to him, I mean, really exciting stuff at what you guys are doing and I, I hope to keep up with it i hope to see you guys adding more services and uh again hopefully more than anything reaching out to people in developing countries that's really what matters yeah. right now yeah yeah i really appreciate that you know maybe a quick comment on this 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 uh, regulatory comment you, you made i mean uh, you know I, I agree with everything you said i think that look i don't necessarily agree with how the current system is set up 100 mm percent. -hmm. I, I agree with a lot of it i think the regulation we have is is to a large degree necessary given mm -hmm. the complexity whether it's necessary or not of the system we've created okay i didn't create the system but as an american yeah you know i i also respect the fact that and believe strongly that that government should fear the people and the people should not fear the government and and so we need to right size regulation for the problems we're trying to solve and the protections we're trying to put in place i think the pendulum has swung a little bit too far but I'm I'm just I'm just another opinion when it yeah. comes to that. The way Abra operates, though, is is we're fully committed to understanding and operating within the confines of the regulations that any one country that we want to operate in has set up. And if countries you know don't like how things are going, they should change their own laws, whether it's to stop Abra or enable Abra, one way or the other. I mean, I think I fully I fully believe that. Um, and so. On the one hand, a lot of what happens in the crypto world is about regulatory arbitrage. I'll, I'll readily give that to any regulator listening. But on the other hand, I also believe in giving the good people and the good actors what they want. And what people want is access. And uh, most people don't say, I need more protection from the government. That's not what we hear when we go talk to people about the financial services they want. What they say is, I need more access to these services. I need credit. I want to invest. I've got money under the mattress. I don't trust my banks. How can I invest in these stocks or or the U.S. markets or in gold? Uh, you know, that's part of why 10% of the Indian population is invested in gold. 
which is an insane yeah. number. Gold is, in, in my humble opinion, not the best investment, right? Abra enables it, but you know, the, the CEO Fidelity doesn't pick and choose which stocks her customers should invest in. Exactly. Right? So Abra, Abra has the same philosophy, but they're doing it because they don't trust the institutions that they're supposed to trust or that were set up in theory by the people to be trusted. But the pendulum has swung so that people aren't necessarily driving the government. It's government that's driving the people. And, and I think we need to fix that. Absolutely. Um, Bill, I mean, I, that's a really good long-term vision. I think it's good to, again, you know, you're, you're like you said, meeting in the regulatory framework, but at the same time, you're doing it in a way where, you know, it's, it's a matter of the regulars playing catch up, if anything, you know, if they really have a problem with what Abra's doing, because you're doing everything proper in that case. And you're not, you know, you're not a you know custodial manager, you're not having to deal with KYC in this case or anything of that sort. It's just simply letting people manage their own money and having very creative ways to these synthetic, uh, the synth synthetic assets, tongue twister, synthetic yeah. assets, uh, and to be able to open up opportunity with that. I think it's a really cool model. So Bill, best of luck with what you're doing. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to have you on later down the road, you know, to catch up and see how you guys are doing, the progress that the company's made, and not to mention, you know, what kind of other services you guys are looking to do. But really, um, honestly, one of the more exciting things I've seen in the exchange space. So thank you for making the time, man. Hey, Bill, can you hear me good? Yeah, yeah, lost for a second, but I, I heard I'm in the end. So right on. Look, I'm happy to come back anytime. Love to give you guys an update, uh, gals an update in, in, in a few months, for example, and, and uh, tell you what's going on. That's perfect, Bill. Sounds good. We'll schedule for some time then. Look forward to it. And that's going to be it for this episode of the Dashcast. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning into this episode. And if you liked it, please give it a thumbs up down below, as well as sharing it with a family or friend member. And if you have any idea as to who you'd like to see on the next episode, definitely leave a comment down below. You guys know I love getting your feedback. Outside of that as well, I want to give a real quick shout out back again to Bill for coming on to the Dashcast. It was not only great to learn a little bit about his past as well as what work he's doing on Abra, but along with that to really see his vision of Bitcoin serving as a protocol for money, very similar to TCPI on the internet. To keep it short, I wish them all the best in their ambitions and I can't wait to have Bill back on in the future. Our sponsor for this podcast is Taxbit. The 2018 tax season has officially begun. Taxbit automates your entire tax filing process by linking up with your exchanges and wallets, running your transactions through their tax engine, and auto-generating all of your tax forms. 2018 was a tough year for most crypto users. Taxbit will help you recoup some of your losses by producing the tax forms you need to claim your tax refund. Sign up today using the promo code DATADASH to receive a 10% discount and a 100% money back guarantee that your taxes will be taken care of this tax season.